quick pub quiz. What is the most British piece of media ever created? Well, you're all wrong because the answer is Angus Long's and perfect snogging. Well, hello, governor. I'm back with another video. Okay, I'll stop that now because I don't think anyone wants to hear me say that. But hello, I'm back with another video. But this one is on quintessential British teenagehood. And this is something every girl in the 2010s should know by heart if they want to know how life was like for Liam, Harry, Louis, and Zane. Not Niall though. Sorry, because if you want to know how life was like for him, you gotta watch Disney's 2020 blockbuster hit, Artemis Fowl. But what makes this movie, I'm sorry, film, so British you might ask? Well, it actually isn't 100% British because it doesn't have an Oxford comma, so just let me fix that up. Okay, now it's 100% British. Awesome, great, perfect. Well, to answer your first question, everything from the pre-production to post-production was for the UK market. First off, it was based on two British young adult novels written by Louise Renison, Angus Thongs in Full Frontal Snogging, and it's okay, I'm wearing really big knickers. If you're from across the pond, like moi, I'll translate this for you. It means a cat, the undergarment perfect for your low waist wide leg throwback to 2000s look, and first base. The second book translating to, it's okay. I'm wearing granny panties. Also kind of weird that they pulled a Philosopher's Stone, Sorcerer's Stone, Sister Switch because it's okay, I'm wearing really big knickers turned into, on the bright side, I'm now the girlfriend of a sex god in the US market. But even though this is so British that it makes uh, pupils at Passmore Academy blush, I think the real reason why the Scotland Yard pushed for this creation so hard was to teach daft Americans that your Mayflower, like ancestry, don't be shy if you cannot tell me the importance of Ravina and squash. But luckily you have me to give you a full comprehensive lesson of the ins and outs of this film um, so you don't have to watch it. But you really should because it's actually really good. Okay. It starts out with you being catapulted in the middle of a scene. When I first watched this, I was just like, wait, did I say that again? Because I was really distracted by the Nickelodeon Mac and Cheese tech 10 seconds before. But no, this is not a bootleg version. This is the real deal. So we know right away is that main character, Georgia Nicholson, played by same name, Georgia Grom, right here is dressed up as an olive. And she thinks she's hella cute, but it's a look <laughs> and her dad thinks it's so much as a look that he doesn't even want to be in the same space as her. Georgia Grom BTW, if you don't know, is dating Mr. Ron Weasley since 2011, which is super cute and they even have a kid together. Adorable. We stand it. So worst charcuterie board food here walks in and it's reminiscent of a film that came out four years prior, an American, you know, remake that came out four years prior, if you will. And also this is a costume party, not a Halloween party, because remember, this is England, and only American and Canada push for spooky cats. Super embarrassed as she should, we get a great aerial view of Eastbourne um, as Georgia runs away from all the mean people from the party. I don't know about you, but as Georgia runs away into the glass jar from where she came from, um, we see that Eastbourne is filled with a lot of geriatric fucks, as you might call them. Um, like, I'm not really sure who she's running from because I'm pretty sure anyone under like 40 was at that party. So she's just kind of mocking everyone around her, like showing her long strides and everything. But that's okay. We love a fit girl. Back at home, Georgia says to the costume department, you did great today, you can go home now. And we finally meet her family. So her family consists of her mom, her dad, her little sister Libby, and Angus. That's the cat, by the way, from the title of the film. On a new date, we see Georgia Nicholson telling you and her parents what her main objective of this movie is gonna be. And that is to throw a Ooh, wicked party at a club. At 15, she wants to evolve away from S Club 7, you know what I mean? We are then introduced to her Biffles, whom they call themselves Ace Gang. They never really explain where Ace Gang, um, the name comes from, but let's not forget the purpose of this film is to get the attention of your 
favorite 2010s British YouTuber, and that can only work if you know the ins and outs of British slang. Um, mine's personally Joe Sugg, but this will work for anyone, including almost British Tyler Oakley. Not a Tory. So, I think the best way we can do this is to play a game that I like to call You Want Mate. So this is super easy. I'll just give you a word and let's see if you can translate for me. Okay, let's start. Well, let's start out. The first one is Ace. Doesn't mean A, shrimps is bugs. B, Katang, the ship name for Katara X Aang from Avatar The Last Airbender. C, Cheetos Mac and Cheese. Or D, Abel's Rat Tail and the Idol. Well, one is not like the other. And the answer is A, shrimps is bug because Ace means awesome, great, fabulous. For the next one, we have Minji. Doesn't mean A, Black Sheet sung by Brie Larson from Metric. B, Closer by the Chainsmokers. C, Work From Home by Fifth Harmony featuring Ty Dolla Sign, or D, Let Me Sign, Robert Patterson from the official Twilight Original Motion Picture Soundtrack, International Deluxe Version. Well, Minji means the opposite of Ace, meaning that Minji is disgusting, terrible trash. And the only song that fits that criteria is B, Closer by the Chainsmokers. I really do not want to hear that again. And finally, the last one is Slag. Does slag mean rat patootie? B, merrily we fall out of line? C, always down for Shaggy Shaggington in the mystery machine? Or D, she believes you lied? Well, from context clues, we know that slag means always down for Shaggy Shaggington in the mystery machine. Well, that's all the time we have for today's edition of You Won't Mate. Come back next week for the Australian special, Shrimp on the Bobby. Great job, class! You certifiably can start using these in your Super Hulog fanfics. You're welcome. Now back to the story. After meeting the school, we find out that there are new sex gods that just moved in, and their names are Tom and Robbie. They're also called sex gods in films, so um, I'm not a James Charles, so don't arrest me, mate. T.Y. Sex God number one, aka Robbie, is played by Aaron Taylor Johnson, who you might know as the one that got his 43-year-old girlfriend, um, now wife, and director at the time, pregnant when he was only 19. And Sex God number two is the other one here. That's Tom. Doesn't really matter, by the way. But just remember, he is technically not the one that's with the cougar. Yes? But since they're only fraternal twins, there's not enough to go around for the Ace Gang, which remember, consists of four girls. But fear not, because Rosie, the shaggy blonde here, already has a boyfriend named Sven. And Ellen is not allowed to have a boyfriend because she doesn't know the importance of snogging yet. So, perfect. Now, there's two guys and two girls. Jazz, the super tall one, and Georgia, remember main character, scheme up with a plan to talk to the boys by visiting their mom's organic food shop. The couples are looking great. And so the two learn that Robbie is already dating Slag Lindsay, which honestly, like, great efficiency. We should, like, give a round of applause to Lindsay because, like, it's only been one week, maybe two weeks max, and you already got with, like, the new guy that everyone's pining over. So, yeah. But, you know, since it's only been one week, two weeks in, let's be honest, how strong is this relationship? But... Before we can even think about being a home wrecker, we actually need to learn how to properly snog because, you know, you can get the guy, but when the time comes and you don't know how to full frontal, you know, smash lips, that's going to be a little bit embarrassing. So what is the best way to learn how to snog if you don't have a boyfriend, you might ask? Well, the answer is to not be a little hoe and kiss someone else's boyfriend or be a little lame virgin and figure it out when you get there. No, 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 honey. The answer is to go to a professional and that professional's name is Peter Dyer. Okay, let me talk about Peter Dyer for a second because he is a menace to society. I mean, who has like a clock this big, like an exam clock in the bedroom. And who sleeps with this like huge ass poster of Hugh Grant like staring at? Also the reason why he has this exam clock is to make sure that his appointments, because he has appointments, can be punctual and on time. And it's like, good for him for working in this economy, but like, mouth herpes, okay? That shit don't go away. 
And that shit especially don't go away because it comes back every year. And it comes back, you know, right before you somehow secured a cute coffee date with the cute coffee brewers that yet you go to, you know, like and see every Tuesday and Thursday before class. Um, but, you know, right before the day before, that shit's still there. And you try to overline your lips, but you now it, it, it's worse and it's bubbling and it's big. And now you just look like a worse imitation of whom should not be named. But I digress. But with a scheme to steal Robbie away from the slag, Georgia comes up with this plan to make sure she can have one-on-one -on -one quality time with him. And that is by pretending she lost her cat, Angus. As a big pussy lover, he agrees to help her. And they go around the city like super effectively. Like Robbie is screaming Angus's name across the rooftop. Just like, just watch. Also, it's in this scene that we find out that the reason why Robbie and Tom, the other twin's name, moved from London is because the rents got divorced. Head Canada, though, I think Robbie was the one who chose to move to Eastbourne because of the large geriatric community. The actual cat, who is taken care of by Jess, gets loose, and Tom, who is just there in his like shirtless glory, goes and helps her find the cat and you know that's how they get close but all is well because as angus is finally getting loose for the billionth time robbie jumps into the bushes and finally is able to like handle angus and give it back to the girls so peaches Don and georgia is now snog ready and has the boy wrapped around her finger so now is the perfect time to start the next phase of action but uh oh, Peter Dyer. Oh, Peter Dyer. That snog must have been so great that Georgia has to reject him by saying she's a lesbian. But before this makes it on BuzzFeed's iconic films that age like milk, everything is resolved because Georgia tells the bloke who randomly pops up in the beginning of the film that she is not in fact obsessed with Slack Lindsay. This man, do you remember his face? Because like, I certainly did not. I was just like, who is this? Like, where is this? face come from like my boy crazy ass was not up to playing a round of where's wally when i first watched this in middle school and i sure isn't ready now with my slightly more refined boy crazy ass also this is the part of the film where we learn where the second word in the movie title comes from basically what happens in the scene is the girlies are making fun of jazz's undergarments choice in the locker room um, because remember, she is climbing the social ladder faster than the tears on your face as I remind you of Susan Boyles' backstory. Yeah, remember her? Tears. But she hasn't fully gone into the dark side because Jazz tells Georgia that Rotten Robbie and her boy toy will be going swimming. And this is where this famous scene takes place. We will applaud the confidence though because Georgia knew she ate Robbie. He is a psychic because he saw that Orange is the New Black will be gracing our screen and will be a big hit that he decides, let me get on this and let me angel invest into this girl. Kissy kissy mwah 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 later, Robbie tells Georgia, I'll phone you soon. But that was a lie. Now days later and still without a phone call, Georgia is not confident. So she decides the only thing left to do is to get Wally to help her on her A-level drama and get the basis of the Stiff Dylans jealous. Who are the Stiff Dylans, you might ask? Well, lower break. The Stiff Dylans actually debuted with 41 on the charts with a cover song for this movie. They released another cover song that also made it to 93, but things went south because of the drama behind the scene. Lots of mum calling and trashing hotel rooms later. They disbanded within the year. Lots of ego, am I right? Well, no, because I lied about all of that. But honestly, like, it's good that they disbanded in 2008 because lead singer James Flanagan is now working behind the scenes and has, like, um, song wrote, produced, and lent his vocal talents to a bunch of, like, top girly hits. I mean, he has worked with, like, the biggest names, our favorite pop girlies, which include our favorite Velma, Hilly Kyoko, gay icon Carly Rae Jepsen, camp queen Marina, and, most recently, the band every Seattle hipster born in 1984 love, except Pinkerton, Weezer. But again, I digress. The plan actually works and the Stiff Dylans 
basis is not liking what he is seeing. He is Jill and Nick. Or he can, you know, the run and chase Graham after Georgia and ask her, you know, what's wrong and blah, 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 blah. Slag Lindsay grabs him and says, uh-uh, no, 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 no. You're not going after her. Also, we find out that Wally, real name Dave, or if that's his character name, has fallen for Georgia amidst this plan that he does not know of. And he tries to go in for the smooch. No success, love. Georgia is like, no, no, no. And like, you know, side eyes. This is actually the second time Georgia has somehow like roped in two guys to falling in love with her. And you know, you might think that if you have like two guys liking you, you might want to stop getting with the guy who has a girlfriend and stop being a homewrecker. But you know, you do you, girl. The next day, Georgia is like, super gloom and it's like oh my gosh my female acting skills is a little too good like ah juilliard accept me um but maybe i should apologize to dave for leading him on so she's just like hey dave and dave is like sawed off and just like huh excuse me two seconds ago you were in love with me what happened well let's put on our little detective hat and think how did he find out that she was using him Dun dun dun! The answer is Jazz. Stinky stinky stinky. Jazz was the one that let the info out to the Daily Mail that Georgia has been playing guys, getting them to help her make Robbie her true love jealous. And, you know, it gets messy. It sounds messy and it gets messy. Jazz is like, I don't want to be your friend anymore. Georgia's like, no friends, uh uh, get away from me. And they like totally fight. Also, Robbie, the nobleman he is, also tells Georgia that, by the way, I was actually gonna break up with Lindsay and be with you the day of our Brighton performance, but I saw you getting chummy with my mate Dave there and thought, you know, maybe, maybe there wasn't something that I thought, but you know, now that you have been revealed to be a bad friend and you know, playing all my friends like that, ugh, I don't wanna be with you. She dug her own grave, basically. Now Georgia is like super super depressed as she should because you know she just lost all her friends and the boy and like what I mean by all her friends is that like two of the ace gang members like ace of spades and ace of clubs have been MIA for the past like 30 minutes of the film so um someone should check like Pierre Dyer's house you know something could be a little fishy there okay so now Georgia is like Prozac and therapy yeah now that's too weak for me I think um, the big girl move to fix all my issues is, you know, not to apologize to Jazz, uh, don't apologize to Dave, not realize that I am probably way too young for Ross and Robbie, and definitely not file a missing persons report for my other two best friends. No, 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 no. What I should do instead is, you know, change my hair, um, do yoga, and move to New Zealand. Like. Like moved to New Zealand like any other upper middle class, like late 20s woman who goes to Thailand to find herself after her shit boyfriend breaks up with her to sleep with Jesse, short for Jessica from Perfect Design. Eat, pray, love. This is also like a great time to talk about like the side story that was going on while all of this was happening. I'm like her dad in the beginning of the film is sent to Down Under, but you know, not the kangaroo one, but the fruit one for work and her mom is like hanging out with some fit handyman and neglecting the family while all of this is happening because divorce be be scary and it's basically the topic of Georgia's college essay on you know the hardest thing she has dealt with so far. Georgia decides embracing her Harvard ways will probably be the only way to get her family back together. Like Bilbo, the trek to Mordor starts with a party, specifically Georgia's quinceanera. Mommy dearest, you know, she sees that Georgia is so sad, so gloomy, and you know, she tries to cheer her daughter up by telling her that, you know, I was listening to your request for a uh, MTV style, my sweet 16 minus one birthday bash, but you know, she is four months too late. Live, laugh, love Georgia, that's not her anymore. But her birthday does come and Georgia succumbs to the idea that maybe I can go like dancing with my mom or something, like something super low key. So she comes down the stairs and has her like Hermione Yule Ball moment. And it's good that she goes out because surprise, everyone she has ever bested somehow is at this party. Um, how did this party come about you might ask? Well basically, Jazz put it on. 
you know, Jazz, the one that she never apologized to, question mark, question mark, question mark. Basically, she's just like, okay, like, you're still my best friend, blah, 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 blah. I am gonna be the bigger person because, you know, obviously you're not. So I'm gonna, you know, plan this party that you've always wanted. And, you know, we can rekindle this friendship without you ever needing to apologize to me and calling me and my boyfriend, like, losers. Also, it is this time that Alan Davies is released from Taika Waikiki's spell and announces that the producers didn't see the market return for the Real Housewives New Zealand and he'll be moving back to England. This happens because, you know, during Georgia's minty beat earlier in the film, um, Georgia basically goes to her dad's work probably not paid enough, a receptionist, and tells her that she's missing her dad. HR by day and office gossip, also probably by day, lets this info slip to George's dad's boss. This is also like the only part of the film that is like super unrealistic because capitalism, especially earthquake, geotechnical, wind, power, etc. question mark, would never reunite a family. Also, the guy Georgia's mom like was totally fancying throughout like all of this turns out to be gay so problem solved but phew this is also like a great scene because we find out that all the members of the ace gang are alive and they somehow woke up from peter dyer's like hellscape of a room ellen is then set up with dave slash wally uh rosie's twin is set up with peter dyer interjection if i may i thought this was rosie the first four times i watched this film because of their blonde hair I actually scrubbed through the film to make sure I wasn't having another like mac and cheese thought drift again and missed the part where she and Sven broke up. No, this isn't Rosie. That's just some other girl that pops out of nowhere just to make Peter Dyer like have a girl at the end and like, you know, have a happy ending. But like real mystery here, the credits have a guy that plays Sven. Like this man does not exist on the internet. I cannot find a single photo of him. His website is empty and I am not gonna pay money for like an international call request for his headshot in 2008. So um, tell me please if I miss a scene where Sven shows up because I actually cannot find him. This is the real reason why Rosie never had any screen time in the film because she was too busy uh, getting rid of her tracks. <laughs> also, we get this like really sad scene of um, Lindsay wallowing at her party that no one shows up to. Also, um, I forgot to mention, but Lindsay's party was the same day as Georgia's like birthday bash. So, you know, you can't be at two places at once. It would also be a great way to end the film because, you know, Sif Dillon's chose to be at Georgia's party and not Lindsay. So obviously, you know, Robbie chose Georgia. But to make sure the audiences really get the message that, you know, Ross and Robbie chose Georgia, we see Lindsay, you know, trucking across town, gets on stage and tells, you know, Robbie, hey, I'm gonna pull a Jacob on you right now. You're gonna choose me, hot werewolf, or her, vampire. The answer is vampire. It's always vampire, okay? And that's the end of the film. And everyone except Lindsay lives happily ever after. Well, what a wild ride. You know, I'm gonna take a quick dive on the music because, oh my gosh, my Brit Pop 2010's British Invasion heart was rocking out to like every song in the movie and like on the soundtrack. Ultraviolet, Banger, that is the song that reached 41 on the UK charts. Um, the scene where Georgia is running um, has She's So Lovely by Scouting for Girls playing. Love it. Uh, not British, but Swedish, so close enough. Uh, Young Folks by Peter Bjorn and John. Um, also, Alex Turner wishes he could have released Cornerstones before 505 because that definitely would have helped their pretty sad album sales. I'm mean, just saying, Domino Records, look at the potential movie soundtrack tie-ins before making huge music changes. Um, let's also talk about the director because she is a force to be reckoned with. In 2002, the bigger British coming-of-age film came out, Vendor Like Beckham. I have to rewatch the film sometimes later because the one and only time I watched it wasn't like in high school because my English teacher believes we would learn more about life by watching 2000s media. It also wasn't because she was pregnant and did not want to teach. Um, I also watched Napoleon Dynamite and Into the Wild for the first time in that class. I uh, love you Mrs. Myrna Dalgleish. Uh, keep doing what you're doing. Unrelated but Mrs. Posh Spice features her vocal talent on the Bender Like Beckham soundtrack. Gotta pay your bills somehow middle class you. Well, that's all I have. Um, if you have any information about the whereabouts of Sven, like, please let me know in the comments. Also, thank you so much for getting to this part of the video. I appreciate you all. Um, and we'll see you in the next one.